Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. For 27 years, the question of what to formally call the country informally known as Macedonia has been a diplomatic thorn in the side of Europe and the Balkans. Macedonia became independent upon the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia in 1991. Immediately, though, the question of what this new country should call itself became a diplomatic and political crisis. You see, Macedonia borders Greece, and the region of Greece that borders Macedonia is called Macedonia. So, for decades now, Greece has systematically blocked Macedonia from calling itself Macedonia. In fact, at the United Nations, of which Macedonia is a member state, it is known as FIROM, which stands for the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. This name dispute has had some real and profound international implications, as my guest today, Damon Wilson, explains. Damon Wilson is the executive vice president of the Atlantic Council and also served for a time at the White House and at NATO, where he helped oversee negotiations between Macedonia and its neighbors. As he explains, the inability of Greece and Macedonia to resolve the name dispute has left Macedonia unable to join the European Union and NATO as many of its neighbors have. But negotiations this summer between the prime ministers of Greece and Macedonia led to a big breakthrough. These countries are now closer than ever to resolving the name dispute. All that's needed now is for the parliaments of both countries to ratify the agreement, and that is no small task, as Damon Wilson explains. This is an extremely helpful explainer on the history of this Macedonia name dispute, which is actually like a really big deal in international relations and also in the United Nations itself. I I mentioned this during the interview, but as someone who covers the United Nations, whenever I I write on this or report on this issue, um, it's incredible and amazing to me the amount of feedback and and oftentimes pushback I get from people who are sort of inflamed and have their passions inflamed by um, this question of of what to call this, this country of Macedonia. Anyway, I think you'll find this conversation very helpful and enlightening. So here is my conversation with Damon Wilson of the Atlantic Council. Macedonia, it's a small Balkan country that's nestled in southeastern Europe. It's at the bottom base of what used to be uh, Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. In fact, uh, the name that the country has been saddled with uh, since uh, the former Yugoslavia fell apart was the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, FIROM. Uh, And so the southernmost province of Yugoslavia borders Greece, and it borders the areas of northern Greece, which Greeks call Thrace and Macedonia, Macedonia. Uh, And hence, uh, this is a country right landlocked, small country, uh, right in the heart of the Balkans, nestled in between Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, and Kosovo. Uh, And it's because of its geography that it has all of this complication. Uh, It's been a part of uh, population movements from the Ottoman Empire to the Austrian-Hungarian, pushing back and forth. And the historic dispute, of course, is where was Alexander the Great and the the great empire of Macedon, and where was that situated? Uh, And so its history has been a little bit uh, uh, tortured by its geography, as in the past, uh, many uh, in Macedonia, many Macedonian nationalists were considered at first Bulgarian nationalists. Um, uh, and and others have seen uh, uh, about a a third to half of the population at times is is Albanian, Albanian speaking. Uh, And then this identity clash with who really owns the term Macedonia with the Greeks. And so precisely because of its geographic position nestled in between these other other nations in Southeast Europe, that it's had a complicated contemporary political experience. And, And in 1991, it gained its independence from the former Yugoslavia or declared independence, I should say. Um, but it was largely spared uh, violence that accompanying a lot of the other uh, former uh, Balkan states. 
States, correct? So yes and no. Um, it sort of received its independence in 1991 because of the collapse of the former Yugoslavia. And it was really, this was an effort that was led first by Slovenia and Croatia. But as they broke apart the union inside Yugoslavia, Macedonia uh, became one of the beneficiaries. And it that's where it found its independence. It gained independence in 1991 as war began to break out. Uh, first a short war in Slovenia, a bigger war in Croatia, and then a really brutal war in Bosnia. And at the time, Macedonia was spared. Um, it was sort of a, almost an afterthought through the big struggle that these countries had, and they had a real problem because they were ethnic Serbs living on their territory. Um, Macedonia didn't really have that in its mix. It was, I don't want to call it an afterthought, uh, but it was not at the heart of the, the bloody wars with the dissolution. That said, things changed, uh, and it uh, the country really... Um, Without agreement on its name, it was called FIROM at the time, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And with a real difficult sort of political status and, and tenuous deal between its constituent peoples um, that were uh, Slavic, Southern Slavs, Macedonian, and, uh, and those that were Albanian, you saw these political tensions begin to grow, um, sort of fueled by what had been helping elsewhere in, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and really an insurgency broke out among ethnic Albanians uh, that began really fighting uh, for their autonomy, if not their independence, or if not their merger with their neighbors in Albania. Um, and it was pretty clear that headed into 2000, 2001, that Macedonia was unfortunately on a pathway to become the next fire uh, conflagration, the next Balkan war. And in an extraordinary sort of round of diplomacy, that's when I had the opportunity to work for Lord Robertson at NATO. That's when NATO really joined forces with the European Union, with the OSCE, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, American diplomacy. And while there was fighting that was beginning in an insurgency, an intense international diplomatic effort led to a, a compromise agreement, brokering a political agreement between uh, ethnic Albanian uh, and Macedonian leaders in the country, uh, producing the Okrit Accords and essentially paving the way then for NATO operation, NATO forces in the country to stabilize the situation. It's one of the great successes of international diplomacy of really averting this country falling into full-scale civil war. Much of this is forgotten because then 9-11 happened. NATO deployed in August, 9-11 hit, the world's attention moved on because of those uh, horrendous uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, but the NATO force remained in Macedonia, later becoming more of an EU presence, and, and really ensured that this sort of fragile country did not follow the pathway into an outright civil war like we had seen in Bosnia. And, and it's, it's fair to say that in the years since, it, it, it did not. Uh, that intervention succeeded, and, and Macedonia sort of developed economically and politically, still you know, having its challenges, but nonetheless sort of evolving and, and, and growing and, and progressing. Um, but, but at the time, as you said earlier, the, the sort of name that was agreed upon was FIROM, right? Um, could you just talk a, a little bit about how that name became uh, agreed upon? Because I, I want to sort of talk more about the sort of the, the contemporary name dispute, but just the, the origin story of, of FIROM itself is, is interesting. It was a, an agreement that enabled Macedonia to join the United Nations. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, this was the key issue. The country is declaring independence, uh, which was really a byproduct of the collapse of the, the, the deal of these country, of these constituent republics within, within Yugoslavia. And so as Yugoslavia was collapsing, Macedonia essentially was gaining its independence. Uh, and that meant recognition from other countries. It meant pursuing a seat in the United Nations. And yet from day one, there was a problem. Its name. This had always been a constituent republic of, uh, of Yugoslavia that was called Macedonia. But no one much cared or paid attention because it was inside another state. And now here it is trying to claim its voice, its right uh, at the United Nations with the term Macedonia. And that's where the objection from Athens 
uh, originated. Uh, Greece was unprepared to recognize and to see this country seated in the United Nations by the name of Macedonia. And so uh, uh, to make to, to come up with an agreement to allow sort of what was reality, this country was becoming independent, the Yugoslavia was collapsing, um, uh, there was an agreement to allow it to take its seat under Syrom, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Very messy, a very difficult, um, uh, very difficult formulation, and one that everyone thought would be permanent, uh, would be temporary. And yet that's the tragic story, is that it didn't become temporary. It's been the albatross around the country's neck for 27 years, uh, through ups and downs in these negotiations. Uh, failure to reach agreement with Athens has been the fundamental problem. And it's not just semantics. Um, this, in some respects, really became not just a name dispute, but a name dispute which therefore blocked this country's I'd argue integration into the West, into its institutions. It it, bro- it, it blocked its ability to, to move into NATO to begin the process of negotiations with the EU. And and, and that's um, because Greece, right, right, basically vetoed its uh, you know talks with the European Union or or its entering talks with NATO. Correct. That's right. You know, there was an agreement, there was an understanding that once Cyron was the name, and that's what it entered the UN for, that the negotiations would continue. And the UN uh, appointed Matthew Nimitz, a, 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 an independent a negotiator, to try to work with both sides to come to an agreement. And so the idea was, okay, let's let things work practically, let this country operate in these institutions under firearm, and in the meantime, diplomacy will continue, and we'll get to an agreement somehow. Um, and yet, it didn't really play out that way. The two sides really didn't come to an agreement. And when push came to shove, and the issues came to a fore, and the country was getting increasingly close to be re- ready to um, uh, uh, apply to NATO, uh, and it was in the membership action plan under the name Firom. Um and it was coming to a head that it was, you know, many of the allies, the United States included, were ready to say, okay, as we head towards our summit in 2008, um, uh, so this is a decade ago, the country's pretty much ready to receive an invitation to NATO. And this is where sort of the game changed. And the Greeks said, well, you know what, that, that, that arrangement we had, to allow the country to enter the United Nations under FIROM, as well as some other in international arrangements. We're not going to give up our leverage on, on the real prize, NATO, and then eventually EU membership. Um, and we're not going to let this country join under FIROM, even though that was sort of the understanding, that was what was expected, uh, that we all wanted a deal on the name. But the absence of a deal, the country could still join as FIROM, just as it did with the UN. The Greeks changed the equation, said, nope, uh, we don't we want to we want to have a name the name dispute resolved before we actually uh, welcome this country into our alliance, and that's when we hit a brick wall in 2008 at high stakes, high drama Bucharest summit, late night negotiations, strong push by the U.S. administration uh, to push NATO enlargement into the Western Balkans, uh, and when push came to shove at the table around uh, NATO leaders. We got a consensus on Albania and Croatia, and we failed to get a consensus on Macedonia precisely because Greek objections, but those Greek objections were backed up by other allies like France that weren't going to put that kind of pressure on Greece. Mm. And and you were there. You you were at those negotiations. Uh, I was. They were pretty painful. I was serving at the time as a special assistant to the president, a senior director for European affairs at the National Security Council, and my remit was... Uh, everything involving Europe. So I had been involved uh, from the, the NSC perspective in both the name negotiations, the NATO summit negotiations, our real push. And we really saw this as an important summit uh, to consolidate um, and to really turn a page on the bloody chapter of the Balkans history by bringing in three countries, Croatia, Albania, Macedonia, and by welcoming them into the NATO alliance, this would really solidify, I think, a sense that the region was coming out of its bloody past and was really going into a future that would offer it a sense of stability, security, and with that, a sense of, of prosperity. And instead, we came out of Bucharest with, with consensus on Croatia and Albania, uh, and despite uh, late, late night negotiations while we were there, there in Bucharest and a lot of negotiations up to then, um, we couldn't get Athens uh, to budge. We couldn't reach an agreement. So so maybe you're an excellent person to pose a question that has been beguiling me for, for years. So I've, 
I've written about this issue off and on, kind of from a UN perspective. My my day job is, is also to write a, a blog about the UN and, and global affairs. And whenever I wrote a post over the years about this name dispute, you know, the the comment section would, would flare up. It really like inflamed passions. I'd get flooded with comments, vitriolic emails. Uh, I, I never quite understood why this name issue touched such like a deep nationalist nerve. Can you uh, explain that to me? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, think about, we've gone through this incredible historic cycle in Europe. It was nationalism, it was militant nationalism, which led to the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century as we saw militant nationalism turn Europeans against each other and brutish and brutal war in World War II. Um, and we've seen this great European project post-1989 uh, to be this interesting set of pressures. On the one hand, it was an embrace of, of countries and their sense of identity and their ability to, to determine their own future. And you saw the countries of the Warsaw Pact, the constituent republics of the Soviet Union, these so-called captive nations really shed that sense of captivity, embrace their identity, embrace their patriotic sense of their own country, their own identity, and their ability to determine their own future, and then voluntarily cede some of that sovereignty by joining the European Union and becoming part of the NATO alliance. And so you see these countervailing forces that have played out in a more difficult way in the Western Balkans. These countries, uh, with the dissolution of Yugoslavia, had a chance to form their own identity, to put an emphasis on their own language, on their own national symbols, their flags. And these are countries that either never had independence or had brief periods of independence, some of them very uh, stained with difficult chapters in their history. And for Macedonia, this was, this was something new, a, a chance to give rebirth um, to a country that had only sort of barely existed before. And so the emotional attachment to your identity, your language, your name, um, this is a historic development for the country, rightly so. And I think that's where you see a little bit of why there's so many emotions attached to this, because this is a country that uh, uh, hasn't been able to call itself a country for most of its period of identity. And this bumped right into uh, the sentiments in northern Greece, people that uh, use the term Macedonia to refer to their region, uh, uh, people in that region that marketed products branded Macedonia. And there's a real commercial dispute of, of how you're using that term as well to market things globally. And of course, the history, who owns the legacy of the Macedonian Empire and Alexander the Great? Uh, and this insecure nation, almost one that slipped into civil war, um, probably went a little bit too far and trying to embrace the symbols, the symbolism of Alexander the Great. Naming the airport after, after, after him for Naming a while. Naming the airport right? yeah. after him, putting up statues everywhere. To be honest, um, this really, after 2008, after Macedonia failed to get into NATO, we saw the country, I think, take a wrong turn. And it was, it's, it's, it, by being vetoed by joining the Western Club, we almost saw it turn internal, become a little bit more nationalistic, to grab at some of these symbols, and in doing so, to actually exacerbate the relationship with Greece, um, and to to, uh, to to begin to almost erode its sense of where it was going, uh, erode the sense that this was a small, democratic, free market country that could be part of Europe, as Europe looked further and further away. It took a turn harsher in, in terms of a weakening of its democratic institutions, so, its rule of law, its economy. So, so can I ask then, what happened after you know 27 years of stagnation? Finally, over the summer, we have progress and we have an agreement between Greece and uh, Macedonia. What, what, what inspired that progress? Why, why did that happen now? So, two pre two pretty extraordinary developments happened. First, Greece. Uh, Greece went through an extraordinary financial crisis that led to really an implosion of its political class and the election of what was seen as a radical left winger, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tsipras um, of Syriza, which shockingly came to power as sort of the bad boy of Europe to challenge the EU and to challenge 
uh, a lot of uh, 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 things within NATO as well, uh, brought a completely new political leadership um, to power in Athens, one what was, what, which was less constrained by previous conventional wisdom, uh, which was less uh, affiliated with the, the disagreements with Macedonia in the past. Um, and having come out, not fully, but essentially come out of this financial crisis, a left-wing leadership in Athens that was willing to sit down at the table and, and, and negotiate this, in part because of the changes in Skopje. What happened after Syriza election in Greece, we saw Macedonia on the brink, crisis after crisis, as the patriotic nationalistic government uh, began to really push the envelope on issues of rule of law. We saw a lot of corruption, a lot of stagnation. Uh, in the past couple of years, the country was on political crisis after political crisis, EU envoy trying to negotiate between the opposition, the government, and then boom, we go into a new election. It's a real close call. Both sides come out about equal. Uh, and after quite a bit of maneuvering, we see a new center-left government led by Zoran Zaev take hold in Macedonia, and that's when things change. The stars aligned. A government in Athens, a government in Skopje, um, willing to shed the, the, the old positions that both nationalists had held in the past in both countries. And Zoran Zaev came to power as prime minister single-mindedly focused on resolving this issue so that he could put this behind him and ensure that Macedonia would be anchored in NATO and the EU. And he has pursued this relentlessly. And it is because of that specific leadership of Zoran Zaev and, and Skopje uh, and the willingness of Cyprus to, to, to do things a little bit differently in Greece that led to the Prespa Agreement. So, so can you just very briefly explain what the Prespa Agreement called for? Sure. This is an agreement negotiated by the two parties themselves. It's not imposed by the Americans or by the EU, uh, as some would have you believe uh, inside Macedonia or Greece. This is an agreement negotiated by the two governments themselves uh, at a lake in the Balkans called Prespa that really captures an understanding uh, that um, that essentially rec uh, that the country of, of the, the government based in Skopje would agree to constitutional changes that would rename the country the Republic of North Macedonia, that would protect the sense of identity and language as Macedonian, but would call this country North Macedonia, and thereby an agreement to be accepted and ratified in a Greek parliament, uh, Greece would lift its objections to NATO membership and beginning the EU accession process. That's the fundamental agreement uh, that, that's built into the Prespa Accords. Um, uh, it does require both sides going through some steps internally, and that's where we've had political drama. But that's the crux of the agreement. Mm -hmm. and, and and basically, the, the the very briefly, can you explain the the political drama? Because as you mentioned, you know, it requires agreement by parliaments in what will be called, hopefully, the Republic of North Macedonia and uh, in Athens. Um, how close are both sides to reaching the sort of requisite political internal support needed to, um, to, to move forward with this agreement? You know, this agreement's on a razor-thin margin. It has been, it will be, and it's going to be high stakes, high drama until the very end. We've just come out of an uh, extraordinary period in Macedonia where after the agreement was reached, uh, the opposition expressed a, a lot of displeasure. And uh, Zoran Zaev decided to call a referendum, uh, decided to make that a consultative referendum rather than a binding referendum uh, to gain the support of the people to stand behind this. Uh, before he would have to take it to Parliament to get the votes. The referendum didn't go exactly as planned. There was a big boycott movement. Uh, and while the referendum results were over 90% in favor of the question, do you want to join NATO and the EU by accepting the terms of the Prespa Agreement? So over 90% voted yes, under 40% turned out. Um, and while much of the elector uh, Macedonian electorate has actually left their villages to go work in Europe, it's really hard to get to 50% in Macedonia. It was still lower than people would have wanted. And so the ball moved into the parliament uh, and the parliament's court. Uh, the government, Zoran Zaev, his team, his coalition, he had to gain eight more votes from the opposition. Uh, given the way the referendum went, that was going to be a tough task. Um, he raised the stakes by threatening to call early elections, thinking that many of those MPs would know that if if they opposed the agreement and went to early elections, uh, that the opposition, they'd actually lose seats. Um, and in a good, uh, a good story of uh, old politics, arms twisting, 
um, the, he succeeded in getting eight defectors from the opposition to join in backing the vote. And against all odds, he got 80 votes, a constitutional two-thirds agreement, a constitutional majority uh, to set this in train. And, and now, now the ball is in Greece's, right? Now, now the ball is in, in yeah. Athens' court. Exactly. There are going to be a few more votes uh, that have to go through uh, the Macedonian parliament, and I'll have to do one more big vote, two-thirds, but essentially he's now stitched together just barely uh, that coalition. It can fall apart, but but it looks like he's got his pathway in, in Skopje. Now the ball does shift to, to Athens, where the Greek government's teetering. Uh, its opposition, I mean, it's a coalition partner, a small uh, party called the Independent Greeks, um, has balked at this agreement, says they don't want to be part of it, uh, and in fact is, is backing out of the government. And so now Prime Minister Cyprus, just like Prime Minister Zorinzaya, finds himself on a razor-thin margin. Now in Greece, he just needs a majority vote. Uh, the opposition, New Democracy, has declared their opposition to this vote. His own coalition partner has declared his opposition. And so there's a small smattering of sort of independents and, and other centrist groupings that he has got to bring on board to get to a majority vote in the Greek parliament. Uh, and that vote needs to come uh, after the Macedonian process wraps up, which will be at the end of this year, January. The big question looming over this is, can Cyprus call that vote? One, can he stay in power long enough as a minority government? Can he stay in power long enough to call that vote? When he calls that vote, can he win it? Or will he be forced to call early elections? They're not normally scheduled till next October. But it looks likely that that will be pulled forward uh, to the spring of next year. So the, the clock is ticking both in Skopje to finish up by the end of the year and in Greece to get this vote done before they go into early elections. The, the elections in Greece look like they'll lose. The prime minister will lose. If the opposition takes power, they said they would block the deal. So the window is pretty tight. The politics are pretty narrow. Well, Damon, this this is a, a fascinating, and and this Greek drama is yet, I think, another example of just how um, impactful uh, to international affairs, you know, what Macedonia's name is, uh, sort of persists, you know, twenty seven years later. You know, it's it's right. I mean, it is important to step back from this. Why does all this matter? And it matters for, I think, just a couple of reasons. Um, look, it's these kind of differences in, in the past have led to. Um, really bloody conflict in the Western Balkans. And this whole process of, of democratic transformation, opening reforms inside these countries, uh, uh, paving the pathway to these countries becoming part of NATO and then the EU, this isn't just a formula. This is really part of a historic process. It's part of a historic process of former adversaries becoming allies. It's the story between France and Germany having been uh, adversaries for so much of their history to have become allies within the NATO alliance and with, within the EU. Well, that's the same story playing out here. Can we overcome a, a really difficult past in the region and bond these countries together uh, through open uh, relationships, integrated economies, and in alliances that actually take former adversaries and make these folks uh, become part of a community with us standing together. And at the same time, um, we've seen an, a geo, geopolitical competition into the fray. Uh, we've seen Russian influence wanting to play a disruptive role, undermining public opinion for this in Greece. Uh, we've seen the Greek government expel uh, several spies from, uh, Russian spies from uh, Greece itself. We've seen this play out inside Macedonia. Um, there's an understanding that if these historic differences are overcome, that it allows a more integrated Europe, a more integrated NATO alliance to focus on the more difficult challenges ahead of us. And there are those out there, whether they are um, uh, the Russians or, or other forces that really don't want to see, see this succeed. Um, they're legitimate concerns, no doubt. I mean, people who feel strongly about their identity, uh, they're not tools of Russia. They, they feel that those are their views. Uh, but it just shows that there's a little bit of a geopolitical mix to what's unfolding and why there's strategic issues at stake. Uh, well, Damon, thank you so much for your time. This was very helpful. My pleasure. Thank you so much for covering this important issue. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Damon Wilson. I sincerely hope that these parliaments get their act together and ratify this agreement. It has been going on for way, way too long. All right. Before I let you go, a trivia question. Actually, this is like my favorite trivia question. I'm kind of a nerd. It's been my tri favorite trivia question for, for a long, long time. But here it goes. And you can uh, hit me up on Twitter with your answer at Mark L. Goldberg or send me an email using the contact page on 
globaldispatchespodcast.com. The question, what is the name, and no Googling, of Alexander the Great's horse? Hit me up on Twitter or email for the answer. Bye. Oh, and if you promise that you didn't Google the answer, I will mail you a Global Dispatches podcast sticker in the mail. Send me your answer.